Okay, today we are going to continue our discussion of momentum, and we are going to um, move on into something called impulse. So just to get our brains warmed up a little bit, kind of remember what we just learned uh, from the uh, previous video, let's do a problem together. If a football player weighing 1,000 newtons is running full speed at 8 meters per second to make a tackle, what is his momentum? Well, hopefully you all remember our equation for momentum, which is P equals mv. This is the only equation we've learned with momentum in it, so in order to solve for momentum, we know we have to use this equation. Now, let's list what we know from this problem. We know that his weight is 1,000 newtons, and hopefully you all remember what is measured in newtons. It's force. So we know his force. We know his weight, and he's running full speed at 8 meters per second, and 8 meters per second is his velocity. So we know force, and we know velocity. Well, velocity is going to be helpful for us in our equation here, but force is not in our momentum equation. So we need to figure out how to get this football player's mass from his force. So we'll have to use a different equation. So hopefully, off the top of your head, you can remember how we relate force of an object and its mass. It's a very, very important equation, Newton's second law, F equals ma. So we know this football player's weight is 1,000 newtons. We do not know his mass. And if we're talking about the weight of this football player, the acceleration acting on him is due to gravity. It's 9.8. So if we solve for m, 1,000 divided by 9.8, we find that this football player's mass is 102 kilograms. So now we know his mass. So we can put mass in here, and we can put velocity in here. So let's go ahead and do that. The momentum of this football player is his mass, 102 kilograms, times his velocity, which is 8 meters per second. And when you plug this into your calculator, it turns out that his momentum is 816. And remember, the units for momentum are kilograms times a meter per second. Mass times velocity. So that's our answer. So the momentum of an object tells us something about its motion. It has to do with the mass of that object and how fast it's traveling. And in order to change the momentum of an object, to change its velocity or change its mass, I guess, but usually you're changing velocity, you need to apply a force to it. Because remember, if there is no force applied to an object, Newton's first law tells us that an object in motion will stay in motion. If it stays in motion at a constant velocity, velocity is not changing, its mass didn't change, so its momentum did not change. So in order to change momentum, you need to apply a force. And it turns out the rate of change of momentum, or how fast the momentum of an object changes, is equal to the force you apply. So if your change in momentum is really, really quick, you apply a very large force. On the other hand, if your change in momentum takes a really long time, your force that was applied is going to be quite small. And remember, any time we use delta here, or change, you have to do final minus initial. This is really important because remember in the last video, I stressed the importance of direction when you're solving uh, momentum problems. If you switch these two things up, you are going to be really, really muddled. So make sure you are doing final minus initial. We can actually derive or come up with this equation up here from Newton's second law. 
You won't have to do this on your own, but I want to show you where this came from. So Newton's second law is F equals MA. The force applied to an object equals its mass times its acceleration. And we also know the definition for acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So if we go ahead and plug acceleration, this equation in here, we get force equals mass times a change in velocity over time. And hopefully this is popping out at you. Mass times velocity is momentum. We learned that in the last video. So when you have a change in velocity, you have your final velocity minus initial, and the m is distributed. So we have mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity, all divided by time. So this is final momentum minus initial momentum, or going a step further, change in momentum over time. And that's how we got this top equation up here. So the important part of this is that in order to change the momentum of an object, you need to apply a force. And during any kind of collision between two objects, they objects become deformed because of this force and this change in momentum. So anytime you apply a force to something, especially a very, very, very quick force that is really large, its change in momentum will be very large, which means it will deform quite a bit. And you can see that in this picture. This tennis ball was round, and now it's really flat on this end because as it hits the tennis racket, the racket applies a very, very large force over a very short amount of time, which gives us a large change in momentum. So all I did here was I just rearranged the equation from up here. I multiplied both sides by a change in time to get force times delta t equals change in momentum. So this is just another way to look at that equation. And we can use this relationship to define the term impulse. And when we speak simply, impulse is a change in momentum. Any change in momentum is impulse. Depending on the amount of force applied, and how long it takes to change the momentum, the impulse might be large, large or small. But a change in momentum is impulse. And we define impulse to be the force on an object times the change in time. Because impulse is a change in momentum, they have the same units. Impulse also has the units of kilograms meters per second. But we can actually do a little math magic here and write the units for impulse as a newton times a second. So while we talk about momentum in terms of a mass and a velocity, we actually talk about impulse as a force and a time. Even though they are the same thing, we can talk about them with different units. And how are these two things the same? Well, if we have momentum, the units are a kilogram times a meter per second. And I just told you that for impulse, we usually talk about it in terms of a newton times a second. Well, hopefully, most of you remember how you calculate force. You use Newton's second law, F equals MA. So if we're doing force equals mass times acceleration, force is in Newtons, mass is in kilograms, and acceleration is meters per second squared. So we can substitute Newtons for a kilogram meter per second squared. Because when you multiply mass times acceleration, you get force. Now all we have to do is carry over the times seconds from right here. And now we can do a little bit of canceling. We have kilogram 
times meter per second squared times seconds. So we have a seconds on top and we have seconds squared on the bottom. We can get rid of this second and the square here. And we can actually rewrite it kilogram meter per second. And if you'll notice, now these are exactly the same thing. Ding, ding, ding. Check. So a kilogram times a meter per second is the same as a newton times a second. They tell you the same information, just in a different light. A kilogram meter per second tells you the change in momentum given the mass and the change in velocity. While a newton times a second tells you the change in momentum or the impulse through talking about a force and a time. So impulse tells us we can get the same change in momentum with a large force acting for a short time or a small force acting for a longer time. And it turns out this is why you should bend your knees when you land. For example, if this guy has a mass of 100 kilograms and he is going from 7.7 .7 meters per second to 0 meters per second, no matter how fast it takes him to slow or how long it takes him to slow down, his change in momentum is going to be the same. It's going to be his mass times initial velocity and then his mass times final velocity and you find the difference, final minus initial. What impulse tells us is that if you can extend the amount of time it takes, the force will be smaller. So instead of landing with your knees buckled and using a short amount of time to stop, which results in a very large force, you bend your knees and then it takes longer for you to come to a stop. So the force using to change your, your momentum is going to be smaller. This is also why airbags work. Airbags still stop you really, really fast, but they stop you slower than your face hitting the steering wheel would. So then the force on your face as you're changing momentum to come to a momentum of zero is going to be a lot smaller. And finally, this is why landing on a pillow hurts less than landing on concrete. Here, your change in momentum is the same again, but what a pillow does is because it's softer, it makes the amount of time it takes you to come to a complete stop longer. So then the force acting on your body is going to be less. So let's revisit the opening problem and you're going to use this in your homework. So from the opening problem, hopefully you remember, it's a football player weighing a thousand newtons and he's running full speed at eight meters per second. We used our equation for momentum, P equals MV, to find that his momentum is 816 kilograms times a meter per second. So his momentum, 816 meters per second. Oh, I did that backwards. Kilogram meters per second. So now your homework is to use this information, his momentum, to answer the following questions. First, if instead of making the tackle, he trips and hits the ground, besides this really hurting, what is his change in momentum from when he's running to when he has, has hit the ground? And if it takes him 0.35 seconds to come to rest when he hits the ground, with what force did the ground bring him to a stop? So go ahead and work on these and have them ready to turn in the next time I see you.